A day on this island, as you can tell from my eyes, is a long day. The uh, day usually starts up at about 6 a.m. Uh, the researchers and the divers get up. Half the team heads down to the waterfront. They start suiting up for a scuba dive, for a collecting dive, moving their gear out to the boats and, and moving the boats out offshore, while the second half of the team moves up into the laboratory to work on the organisms that we already have in culture and to start doing observations on them. So doing what we call the routine. They are visually identifying or looking at the foraminifera through the jars, determining if the uh, foraminifera still have their spines. Also identifying whether they finished their life cycle and ultimately that's what we want, that shell at the end of the life cycle. And they're recording the data in a logbook on a daily basis. And this is all happening in the background while the divers are offshore and uh, collecting new foraminifera for the uh, next day's experiments. Once the boat leaves the dock, usually with three divers and uh, somebody who we call a topside, somebody to stay in the boat while the divers are underwater, uh, the divers head offshore, perhaps two kilometers offshore. Uh, we move our gear, which encompasses down lines uh, attached to large floats. You got one? Ah, uh, ah, uh, watch out there. Okay. <laughs> So once the divers enter the water and hook up to the uh, tethers, they start looking for foraminifera. And the way we collect foraminifera is to use the bottom of the boat as a dark background and to sit and just move with the boat as the plankton is slowly drifting by and to identify which of the little particles in the water are foraminifera. Taking the uh, jars, these little 120 milliliter uh, Wheaton jars with snap top caps, lining up the foraminifera that are amongst the very, the very many particles that are in the water. Sounds difficult, the first time you get in the water, everything looks like a foraminifera. Well, there are two ways of getting your hands on, uh, on foraminifera. One way, which is the most subtle way to do, is to go scuba diving for them. But this can only be done with the ones that have spines, because the only reason we see them in the water is because they have spines. Then there's another group of foraminifera, which are non-spinos. They don't have spines, and therefore we cannot see them scuba diving. So we have to use plankton nets to collect them. But the big disadvantage is that they are damaged by the plankton net and you need, you know, you're losing a couple of days of culture because they need to recover, regrow their spines before you can really start to work with them. Okay. The divers always compete with one another underwater to see who can collect the fastest and the most accurately. Uh, yes, it is possible to speciate underwater after your eyes get accustomed to seeing foraminifera and I think that the divers that we have going out right now. It's uh, this year we have uh, Spider and Kate and Jordan. Uh, they've gotten to the point where uh, two of them can sit down and collect about 60 foraminifera within about 40 minutes. Then they're at about the 90% level. It's really oh impressive this year. So many doubles and triples. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at least the Guinness Book of Forum records. <laughs> the precious 4M cargo back to the lab. <laughs> well, the reason we go to the Wrigley Marine Science Center is because it uh, provides access to deep water, which is necessary if you want to work with uh, planktonic foraminifera. Also, there is a fantastic infrastructure. So here we're, we're growing foraminifera and we're culturing them under controlled conditions in ways that's hard to do in, in, in specimens that you would just collect from the ocean. Um, and that allows us to understand how, how they respond to different, to different environmental conditions, different experimental conditions, and find out what are the basic chemical mechanisms that, that control um, how they grow their skeletons and how they control both the shape and the composition. We follow the fate of the forearms day by day. You note down what they eat, what they look like, are the spines long, 
how is their isopod activity, what about the symbionts, and so on. And at the end, you have a history of a forearm, and you can analyze that forearm either individually or in a group, but you need this information. You know, documentation is what science is about. The uh, microscopic process is very straightforward. It's classical. We've, we're basically following the techniques of Alan Bay and Roger Anderson, Chris Hemelaven, and uh, Michael Spindler. And uh, along the way, we feed them. And the feeding process is, again, classic from the late 70s. Uh, we feed them one-day-old Artemia brine shrimp. We hatch them every day. Uh, they're about the size of copepods, which is a natural food of foraminifera. And it's possible to pipette one single artemia towards the spines of a foraminifera. And as that artemia bumps into the spines, it gets stuck and the foraminifera does the rest. I suspect that feeding artemia to foraminifera is equivalent of feeding potato chips to a human being. I think there's a lot of fat and lipid in this guy, but I just have to keep the foraminifera alive for two or three days, four days, and then the uh, uh, the shell will fully calcify and we'll have Orbulina sitting in our micropaleo slides ready for geochemical analysis. The next step is once we've gone through all the uh, organisms that was collected in any given day, um, the team will then divvy up the foraminifera into the various experimental groups. Some researchers are working on changing the uh, uh, magnesium to calcium ratio of seawater, others are adding isotope spikes to seawater, and we break up the collected animals into uh, these various groups, and we move them then into a um, controlled temperature box that has fluorescent lights above them, and the fluorescent lights are for the symbiotic algae, which are associated with one of the species, Orbulina universa. At that point, we have light for the symbionts, we have food for the foraminifera, we have a completely controlled environment, and foraminifera do the rest. Well, when the culture work has finished and you have archived the shells, they're physically leaving the island and they're distributed to the labs that have very fancy and uh, ingenious um, machines that can analyze the chemistry of the shells, the elemental ratios, the isotopes. Uh, you can look at structures of the calcium carbonate. Some people are using lasers. So it goes to the different labs all over the world of our collaborating partners. So we make the best use of, uh, of all the work that has been done on Catalina Island. The research is never over until we finally get those data that we uh, off the mass spectrometer from these culture foraminifera and we move them into publications to present at national conferences, international conferences, and to disseminate that information to the scientific community in as timely a fashion as possible so the data can be used for interpreting the fossil record. And then, you know, it's not just the writing that you do and that's the end of it. No, in fact, uh, there are many occasions like this one, you know, this workshop here in Amsterdam, where we get together and we talk about the results. And we try to, you know, get the input from everybody to, uh, to make the best of it. So the road from Catalina Island and culturing all the way to publication is interestingly actually starting even before you, uh, you get to Catalina. You formulate a hypothesis. Uh, based on the current research, the results and controversies, you realize that there is a need to investigate a certain process. You set up uh, the research, you carry out the results in Catalina, uh, you end up with the foraminifera, you analyze their chemistry, uh, and then you look at these results and see whether they support the hypothesis, whether they provide a calibration, a quantitative understanding, and if they do, if you succeed, if they provide uh, useful information, uh, then the absolutely critical thing is to present the results to the scientific community. And uh, at present, the most effective way to do that uh, is through scientific publication. Of course, the publication is then uh, being read by, uh, by scientists all over the world. They use the results, they realize new controversies, they realize that there might be other processes uh, that, are, that are affecting our proxy as well, and then we go back into the lab, perhaps to Catalina Island. Mm -hmm.